Hello? I think we're recording. Yes. Okay. Now I'm hoping that this is going to, I'm going to move myself around a little bit. I know folks would like to not just have a screen in front of them, but a uh, little request for recording the uh, talk that I gave today on exercise being medicine and systemic sclerosis uh, at today's uh, 2021 Sclerodema Foundation patient conference and which is really an honor to be here. It's an honor to be there. And um, so these are my disclosures. And there, these are the wonderful organizations that have provided funding and other types of logistical and um, mentorship support throughout our journey and understanding how exercise, all types of exercise, dance and yoga, um, can um, impact um, impact um, serious diseases, connected tissue diseases, inflammatory diseases. So thank you. So I'd like everyone just to take a moment to consider what their relationship to exercise might be. And um, I'm just going to ask folks to take a second to consider what are some of the words that you might use to describe exercise, the words that come to mind when you think of exercise. It could be anything. And then I'd like to ask you just to think about a time where you felt while you were exercising that you felt beautiful. Just recall that time and maybe a few of the words that come to your mind, whether they're images or sensations. And then I'm going to ask you to think about if and what are some of the things that might come between you and your relationship with exercise? What, is, what comes between you and exercise? Maybe the top three things. And then are there any particular fears that you might have related to exercising? Are there things that make you afraid about exercising? So during, during the talk, lots of folks uh, put words in the chat and these words are very similar to what we're going to look at later where there was an actual study that was done to to try to understand how people with systemic sclerosis viewed exercise and experienced exercise but um there's a lot of commonality and a lot of similar fears and a lot of similar uh, challenges so today's talk is going to be an overview where we're going to explore the power of exercise um, in relationship to systemic sclerosis and one thing to recognize is, is that the nature of the body is that virtually all systemic sclerosis manifestations can have some benefit through exercise. Um, exercise has both general and targeted benefits, and we'll talk a little bit about that, meaning general like systemic a whole body disease modifying, for example, the way for what we take mycophenolate or rituximab or tocilizumab for, but there's also targeted benefits both uh, locally to, to certain areas and for certain particular manifestations. Um, and then the other thing is, is that there's so many types of exercise and so many types of exercise, any movement we do benefits us and can ultimately benefit system, systemic sclerosis um, potentially. And all safe physical activity, we'll talk about physical activity in a moment, 
what that means, but all safe physical activity is modifiable, meaning everybody can exercise and every exercise can be modified so that folks are comfortable and feel safe exercising and beneficial. And we're gonna talk about the difference between physical exercise, exercise, stretch, strength, aerobic and endurance types of exercise. Just, I mean, but the most important thing that I want folks to take away, if there's nothing else, that folks take away this one thing that's so important and it's the main cultivator of how, um, how good exercise is gonna be for us is that you are your body connection guru, you. You are it, not anyone external to you. You know your body and cultivating this guru is cultivating a listening. It's cultivating a safe environment. It's cultivating a deep friendship with one's body. And dovetailing on that is this concept of what a guru does, which is habituation. It's a, a self-kindness. It's, self, it's a positive self-regard. And it's a, it's a support for oneself and it's listening to oneself. So here we are, let's take a moment. True to the gurus that you are, everything I need to know is inside of you. So wherever you are, if you wouldn't mind uh, placing your hands on your chest or one hand on your chest, one hand on your belly, wherever you're comfortable and allow the palms of your hands or your fingertips to uh, make contact with the, that surface. Allow your eyes to gently soften to close or to a hazy gaze in front of you. And you're just going to allow your attention to rest on the sensation of the palmer surface of your hands and the contact, the changing contact that it has with the breath as it moves in and the breath as it moves out on its own. We don't have to do anything. We just breathe. We're here and we breathe. And just enjoy the sensation between the chest wall or the abdomen wall that's rising into the hands and decreasing in intensity away from the hands. And if your mind wanders, just allow your mind to come back and rest, ride on that sensation, that changing sensation between the thorax and the hands. And allow yourself to enjoy three more inhalation, exhalation, rise, fall into the hands. And when you're finished, when you get to three, allow your eyes to gently open And come on back to what would have been the Zoom room where we all did come back to. So this is a picture of my dad. We don't really have too much time to talk about it, but uh, my I have a long history of uh, exercise, dance, teaching, teaching expressive movement um, before going to medical school and um, therapeutic. Um, relation to body movement. Um, and this, I really had this experience with my dad. And so I have from that experience understood the importance of physical exercise on one's physical health and one's um, uh, emotional and psychological health and hoping and helping to cope with very difficult illnesses whether you're the person experiencing the illness itself or whether you are the person 
who is um, being there for a loved one. And exercise is a powerful, powerful instrument. So eat, sleep, move, beauty. These are the four pillars you've heard me talk before of healthy life and systemic sclerosis. Good eating, quality sleep, all of these interrelate to each other, moving our bodies and feeling ourselves in beauty and surrounding ourselves in what we find to be beautiful and uplifting. So nutrition, um, the Scleroderma Foundation has many wonderful educational seminars that are online on GI tract and food tolerance. Um, and uh, we might be coming up with more, <laughs> but, um, but nutrition is essential, choosing healthy foods. Um, and uh, we're learning more and more that there, there is some kind of con in inflammatory connection related to the microbiome, making happy gut, gut flora um, influences infl inflammation motility. Um, um, so enough said, but I do wanna give a plug for our study, the, um, the scleroderma diet study. So um, please write down this information. We still have some spots. We'll, we might be closing shortly, um, but, but this is a wonderful experience and it has been a wonderful experience for us too and to meet beautiful people. And it's a remote study. So you can do it from wherever you are. Um, uh, and so sleep, sleep quality is tied to inflammation levels, good sleep quality, lower inflammation, uh, good sleep quality, higher brain power, work productivity, uh, less pain, you name it, sleep is essential. It is as essential as what we're gonna say about exercise. Um, um, so, and then here we are, movement. So we're focusing on movement today of all these things. And this is just to remind us that every little movement that we do is beautiful and is healthful for us. Um, and we do this in beauty. And when we engage with doing this in beauty by having that sensual experience, for example, feeling the air on our skin or feeling that gorgeous sense of the body in motion through space or that lovely massage feeling that we get when we're walking or doing some kind of lifting or pressing. Um, these are gorgeous feelings and it's connecting with that gorgeousness of the movement, that deliciousness of the movement, um, whether it's that light airy feeling and spaciousness or whether it's that uh, kind of more muscular sensation, that is what's gonna keep us enjoying and finding pleasure. And, and actually it's gonna keep our joints healthier because when we have those experiences, that means we're going to be uh, in better alignment because our muscles are relaxed where they need to be and they're contracting where they need to be as opposed to um, over muscularizing and then destabilizing a joint and, and then possibly a tear of a ligament or a tendon. So the other part is beauty, surrounding ourselves in beauty, thinking of ourselves in beauty. Um, we know more and more research is, is yielding that when we surround ourselves with um, kindness, when we are kind, when we um, watch uplifting things, when, when, when we put ourselves in nature, we, um, we decrease stress and we decrease, decrease inflammation. Um, those are very important things when you're living with systemic sclerosis. So, um, yes. Uh, Living Well, Heart, Lung, Muscle, and Mind is our YouTube channel um, where we try to put out some love in regard to um, mindfulness and exercise. And here we go, exercise is medicine. And when I say exercise is medicine, I'm, this is not a euphemism. This is not hyperbole. And this is not just a cute little phrase. This is very serious business. Exercise is medicine, full stop, no going back. Exercise is medicine no matter what health condition one happens to live with, exercise has a beneficial effect and a modifying effect. Um, so we're not just feeling good, we're changing something on a biologic level as we see in, in mild to moderate diabetes 
or we see in hypertension. We can change the profile of these disease, diseases through engagement with exercise, with healthful movement. Um, so uh, for example, if you stand up, you are going to emit a cascade of enzymes that work to break down cholesterol, for example, that work to help drink up glucose from the bloodstream, if you happen to be a diabetic, um, and, uh, or, and transform cholesterol into good, healthy cholesterol. So there's all sorts of um, ways that when, whenever we contract muscle, whenever we move our bodies, um, we are inciting this global factory of medicines, all types of medicines for depression, inflammation, um, inflammation, very importantly, we'll talk more about that, um, glandular function, meaning salivation and, um, and, uh, and eye wetting um, and sweating. These are all very important things. So moving the body, so much. So moving our bodies, so very important to understand this concept. And I think this is what, when I go back and I think about my dad, and I think about how we worked together to keep a modicum of fitness. Um, when, we, when, when, we, when we are more conditioned, we are able to tolerate symptoms more. We're able to tolerate and manage physical symptoms and psychological ones too, but physical symptoms um, like breathing, pain, fatigue. We have more capacity to be able to handle these things. Moving the body, we increase circulation, has a myriad effects. When we increase circulation, we're laying down more blood vessels, we're repairing blood vessels where they're damaged. Um, um, uh, we're getting them to function better. Um, we condition nerves um, and we condition the, the glandular function that I mentioned before. Um, we are reducing inflammation in the body. Um, muscle emits, we're going to talk about this, emits um, chemicals that, re, that interfere with inflammatory pathways and actually reduce inflammation, interfere with fibrosis pathways. Uh, and it increases um, these biochemical interactions that are required for healing, um, healing skin. Um, and exercise conditions the skin through movement, through a physical massage, through sweating. It provides skin with, um, with uh, activity and chemicals and function that it needs. Um, oh yes, strengthens bones and, um, and it has a direct impact on the brain, biochemical impact more than just endorphins on the brain and our psychological uh, interrelations, outputs, communication. Um, and again, a muscle protects and strengthens the joints. So before we go any further and um, everybody gets so gung-ho about exercise and you should be gung-ho and you should love it, love it, love it. But um, a, a few qualifications that I want to get out there uh, which are that exercise is a powerful adjuvant therapy, meaning an, a therapy to go along with, to augment another therapy. Um, and because I'm not saying what's important to everyone understand is that I'm not saying that exercise is going to ultimately replace these life-saving medications that we, uh, we use in systemic sclerosis like mycophenolate, rituximab, tocilizumab. Um, those are life-saving medications and systemic sclerosis is a very, very serious disease. Um, and it may end up um, modulating how much or how often one needs medicine, but um, one, um, one must adhere to um, what the scleroderma specialist community feels are um, the life-changing medications if we if somebody thinks you need to be on them so that's just one thing and the other thing is is that exercise is an instrument for peace it's an instrument for peace within ourself it's an instrument of peace for our body and it's an instrument of peace between ourself 
and our body. And why am I saying this? I'm saying this because as human beings, we love to grab onto something, think it's gonna, uh, we're gonna beat the heck out of it and beat the heck out of ourself. Um, and if, and then any change that happens that's not good, we, we blame ourselves. Uh, maybe our eyes are getting drier, or maybe our medicine needs to be increased. Maybe we needed another dose of rituximab, or we have a new digital ulcer appear. We, we tend to want to blame ourselves, but this is not that. Because when we do that, we're creating the psychological stress. And psychological stress, we know, clear. Now we have decades of data for this. Psychological stress causes biological stress. So if you happen to notice that you're feeling misaligned between your mind, what it's saying and what your body's feeling and your heart and you're feeling unhappy, ask yourself what's going on. Notice your disappointment, notice and ask yourself about a way in. Oftentimes that's with gentle movement, just feeling the air on your skin, going for a walk, reading a beautiful poem, finding whatever brings you back home. So if something's tearing you from home where you're beating yourself up and you're not feeling comfortable in your home, figure out why. And you, oftentimes there's, um, there's a beautiful way in. And sometimes and oftentimes that could be exercise, like I said, so there you go. And saying this habituation. So habituation, we don't need to go out and this inner guru is going to help us habituate. We don't need to go out blockbusters and start exercising like mad. We take things in stride. And what we do is we learn self-regulation through exercise. We learn how to be kinder to ourselves through exercise because we're, we're doing a self-regulatory activity when we exercise. And we're learning and reconnecting deeply with ourselves to be able to recognize self-care aspects. And we're learning how we're paying attention, when we're paying attention, and how are we paying attention? Are we paying attention to ourselves in a bully frame of mind or in a loving frame of mind? A loving frame of mind, that's the way. So you are your healing sanctuary. You are your healing sanctuary. Enough said. So, uh, this talk is spurred by this paper that has just come out. You will find this paper on the conference hub. Um, we ask that the publisher has it an um, embargo for a few months longer um, because they're relying on subscription services to help support the cost of the paper. Um, but if you have a university account that has access to SLVR, you will still be able to get it also but but what we do ask is to please be mindful use use this article it was written for patients it as but it was written for scientists to spur them on to do research but it was also carefully written so that patients could understand this and use this article as a tool but we ask folks until it's freely available free access we ask folks just to be a little bit careful about how you're sharing it um out of respect for the publisher, please. Um, and so we've convened as a group, the G-Force Global Fellowship on Rehabilitation and Exercise and Systemic Sclerosis, we convened in 2020 um, because we all recognize and believe and have been working in this area for years. Um, and we convened to be able to describe, to characterize and to um, help guide research in this area. Uh, and we set out and to describe the research that exists in systemic sclerosis, exists in connective tissue diseases generally, exists in a deep dive into um, the exercise effects in all diseases as a disease modifying med medicine, and the mechanics and the molecular interactions of exercise, and how that could potentially relate to each, each and every systemic sclerosis manifestation. And this resulted in this paper where, where, we, uh, where we break it down and we share it out. And we're hoping that we're spreading the love and we're hoping that we're, we're supporting other researchers to get funding 
to do more work in this area because we believe in exercise as an essential and powerful adjuvant uh, and targeted adjuvant to um, systemic sclerosis therapy. Um, so here's a good place to have a look. And you'll notice that there's four shapes on this screen. The first shape is the large shape physical activity. And what am I saying here? I'm saying every little movement that you do, even breathing, because that diaphragm is a big, whacking, great big muscle. Uh, anytime we're contracting muscle, we're doing some kind of exercise. Um, so every little thing that we do, walking to the mailbox, walking the dog, um, even petting Violet, hi. You can't see Violet, but she's here. Um, every little thing that we do is physical activity. Hi, Vi, excuse me. Um, and then though, what is exercise? Well, exercise is a type of physical activity and it is an activity that is planned, it's timed, and it's scheduled. It's targeted to improve health. We do it to, to target health issues, whether that's global health or whether that's to increase circulation to maybe assist in the healing of digital ulcers or whether it's using our facial muscles the way Janet Poole teaches us um, to um, help strengthen the muscles of our face and help reduce tightness in the, in the face you know, area. Um, and there's different types of exercise. There's aerobic exercise where, where we, we tend to be moving the whole body that's involving um, uh, putting a little, bit of, a little bit of healthy stress on the cardiovascular system, getting the heart pumping, getting the lungs moving. And what that does is pumps blood throughout the whole body and helps to condition um, the nerves, muscles, et cetera. Um, it's, a, it's a whole body experience. Resistance, resistance exercise. What does that do? Resistance exercise helps us with, physic, with, with muscle strength and it helps us with muscle endurance. And we're gonna talk about that um, a little bit more later. The muscle strength is that momentum, that gathering your strength and oh, giving it everything you've got. Endurance is keeping it up, is sustaining it. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, stretching, stretching is that beautiful thing that we do naturally, that all animals do naturally. And that is to give the muscles a chance to lengthen a little bit beyond their norm so that they can relax and they can be responsive and they could, be, and they could protect themselves. They're responsive enough to protect themselves from, from tearing and injury. So let's look at this little box in the bottom. So it's talking about the intensity with which we do things. So we know exercise, in, when we want to do exercise, especially in the aerobic capacity, we want to do exercise to a moderate level. And if you look at this box, you can see it's divided into low light, moderate, high, high, very high, vigorous. Okay, and so, Yes, we can gauge our heart rate, uh, our maximum heart rate, and then go for a, a portion of that heart rate, which is either 50% or 70% or 85 to 90%, yikes. But we can also just know we're gurus, for God's sake, we're gurus. So we can test, we can know, we can, we can test what um, level we're at by how we're breathing and what we can do. So if, if I'm walking really fast, I can, I'm able to hold a conversation, but it's a little bit tough, just a little bit tough. I'm probably around moderate, you know, um, moderate intensity. That's a good enough description for anybody. So if I get to a point where I can only get out a few words, <laughs> home, that kind of thing, um, then I'm probably at high. If you, when you're very high, you can't speak um, because you, you just don't have the, the all your, all of your reserve is going to keep, keep your muscles and your body moving that you don't have the reserve cardiopulmonary wise to do something uh, frivolous like speaking. So, um, and the other thing that I would just share about this is, is that an exercise that is a high intensity exercise for you today, 
like I can say, you know, for some of my patients, it it requires an awful lot and they get out of breath terribly just walking from the sofa to their bedroom. And so that is a high intensity exercise for them. Um, whereas that might be a low or light exercise for some of the rest of us. The other thing that I'll say is, is that with exercise, the idea is that we're moving, we're, we're making those exercises that are moderate or high intensity through our conditioning, those exercises are going to become low and light in time. That as, as our body gets more con conditioned and we have the capacity to, to, um, it, to, to engage in those exercises, and, and then we'll find that we can do more things that we couldn't even think of doing before. And those things are becoming moderate. And then soon they might even become low and light intensity. So, um, so this is how the, the, the descriptors of exercise work. So this ball up here in the right area, it is, um, it is describing what many people typed into the chat which are some of the challenges that we find, motivation, boredom, um, pain and discomfort, fatigue, feeling very fatigued. Are these are barriers and challenges. Um, the fact that when, when, we, when we're deconditioned or when we're disabled in some way, we, we're not as able, it takes us so much longer to do something. So we just don't do it, we let somebody else do it. An example is walking to the mailbox. You know, because I move slower because I'm, just because I, 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 I'm having these troubles, um, uh, uh, it's taking me longer and I don't wanna spend the time doing that. Um, but actually the, the thinking is, is that doing that is helpful and that increasing physical activity as much as possible is a helpful thing. Other things is this fear of overexertion. Um, in some cases, it's true, it's, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and, and our decreased fitness levels contribute to our lack of motivation or desire because we we, we feel unworthy. Um, and the limited range of motion, depending on what kind of exercise you want to move into, and, and for fear of breathlessness and also GI symptoms. These feed into how we feel about exercise. And then the other, once again, it'd be psychological, um, spirals that we can feel, downward spirals that we can feel when we don't exercise or the weight of having a disease um, and we're, we're trying to just get on with our lives and it just the thought of making a decision to exercise, it just seems we're so burdened by the emotional, psychological and the, the physical aspects that, that it, it just, it's too much for us to move up and break through. Um, but, but what I'm here today saying is, is that I'm hoping that this is going to be inspirational, that people will be able to find reason to break that bubble, um, to begin to engage slowly and softly and find the beauty and the pleasure and the ease that it brings. Um, okay, enough said. So these are our four, the G-force, the four overarching principles that we wanted to impart to folks. Um, which is keep moving, replace, and these are in alignment with the World Health Organization's recent uh, November 2020 edicts. Um, keep moving, reduce sedentary life and moments as much as possible, whether you're sitting at a computer, whether uh, it's uh, doing little tasks throughout the day, um, opt for movement, opt for moving the body, opt for that activity. Even if you're, you're sitting at a chair, just squeezing your bottom, the, the, we'll talk about that more in a second, but I mean, anything that you can do. And then the, the second principle is amp it up. You're gonna find that things are becoming more easeful when you, when you engage in exercise. But this point is about becoming, not becoming complacent. It, keep amping it up. Find that exercise that was once high, but it's now moderate, and try to make that exercise a light activity. So giving yourself a little bit more intensity or a little bit more length of time in, the, in, in, in whatever choices you're making in your exercise routines. And, and this is very important um, for continuing that journey of getting 
more easeful and conditioned in your body. And the third pillar is exercising for life. So we're exercising for our whole body fitness, um, our whole body um, inflammation levels, um, our, our whole systemic experience of what it is to be a living person, as well as what it is to be a person that has systemic sclerosis. Um, and um, that exercise for life means embracing the beauty and the pleasure, the sensuality of the exercise, no matter how rigorous, no matter how, how rigorous, make that connection um, and sizing exercise to fit you. So if your arms can't go all the way up, you know, you go where you, 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 you need to go for you. And maybe in time, there might be a bit more range of motion, maybe. So, and then the fourth pillar is dedicated, dedicated to recognizing what are your particular manifestations related to systemic sclerosis and using exercise, whether that means, and oftentimes it may mean engaging occupational therapists, physical therapists, respiratory therapists to, to address and target exercise to meet those needs. For example, the face, mouth, hands, feet. If you are somebody and many, 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 many people with systemic sclerosis have, have impacts of muscles um the lungs etc so um and and uh, these boxes here that's more detail but everything should be safe everything should be pleasurable and um and usually you can use guide as a guide the pleasure your pleasure the sensation that you feel in terms of pleasure as an indication of how safe this exercise is for you um, and so that's paying attention to the intensity, speed, force, making sure you're not overstretching, but giving yourself just enough stretch to feel, mm, that feels good. Um, okay, so our relationship with exercise, as you can see, we're talking about as a global community of experts. And um, by the way, uh, the, the G-Force is made up of all, all sorts of people that you can imagine, all sorts of experts, physicians, nurses who have an interest in this, um, that are known internationally for this, um, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, respiratory therapists and rehabilitationists, um, speech therapists, basic scientists, because we've got to get those biochemicals measured, um, and patients, very importantly, patient advisors. Um, and so you can see, we're, so what, our relationship with exercise is changing globally as we learn more expansively and more deeply about these mechanisms of exercise. But as we go back to thinking about that guru concept, this is a journey that's gonna be an everlasting relationship with exercise and with ourselves. So habituation, again, reminding you, this is what it's about. Habituation is a guru type of thing. Um, so here we go, biophysical impact of exercise. It is amazing. So we gathered together as G-Force, we met, we discussed, we were hyper high on each other. We, we couldn't get enough of what we were learning, what we were doing, what we were sharing with each other because we each came from different disciplines. And, um, and what we learned from each other and diving deeper into the literature and teasing the literature apart, the evidence based on exercise. Um, this is what I have to say, is that the biophysical impact of exercise is it's thousands and thousands of bejeweled stars, sparkling light within ourselves, deep and throughout, sparkling deep and throughout the mind and the body. It's an effervescent thing. It's a myriad thing. And I don't think in my lifetime, we are ever going to ever be able to harness and understand all of the benefits of exercise. These past five years, this is going to be the decade of the muscle, by the way. I'm certain of it. Or, or at least we're, or we're at some point in the decade of the muscle because what we're learning is phenomenal related to muscle and muscle activity on its impact, even in cancer. 
Okay. Boom, boom, boom. So before we go on, I would like to everyone in their back in their mind have a background idea of why this is important systemic sclerosis because we're going to be talking about these disease paradigms that are uh, inherent in systemic sclerosis and having this as the backdrop can help us understand the interjection of exercise so um, um, systemic sclerosis is a disease of vascular injury I said that causes inflammation and injury and it sparks further inflammation and injury. Inflammation is something that can be quieted and quelled. It can be reduced. And therefore, when we reduce it, we can prevent damage. But as it moves forward without treatment, for example, without microphenolate or without your other, other treatments that you might be uh, familiar with, there um, it leaves damage behind that is not treatable, that is not reversible. So exercise might be able to help that damage, might be able to help you manage with that damage that's left behind, but we can't actually change the profile of that damage with exercise. But what can happen is you can change how you're living with, with it and how we're augmenting our bodies to be their best that they can be in the face of damage. So what we want to do is we want to try to intercept inflammation as much as we possibly can. Whether it's, a, whether it's pure inflammation to the blood vessels and uh, other organs, or whether it's a combination of inflammation and fibrosis. Um, it's, it's never too late, but there's different impact. Um, so, but, but exercise is for everyone and can increase the health of everyone. So let's focus on muscle, muscle. Muscle, muscle, it's it, it's it, it's unbelievable. It is like an endocrine organ. It is like an organ in and of itself. It talks with every, uh, the things that occur with the contraction of muscle, the, what it emits, the pathways that it interferes with, interacts with every, every organ in the body. It, so there's a modulating effect of contracted muscle and the, the biochemicals that it produces on every organ of the body. That means the gut. That means uh, helping the, the, the microbiome become healthier. It means helping with GI motility. It means helping the nerves of the GI tract, for example. These are the things that are emitted. Other things. So when we contract muscle, yes, we, um, are, we feel better in our brains and we feel better emotionally and psychologically. We know about endorphins. But, but, there's, but there's many, many more um, bio, biochemicals that actually have remarkable properties that, for example, when you contract muscle, you're, you're, you're sending biochemicals to the brain. The biochemicals are absorbed by the brain and those biochemicals transform certain proteins that are responsible for depression and allows those chemicals to be peed, released from the brain and be peed out. So we are, I mean, it's unfathomable. When I'm talking about thousands and thousands of stars and, and twinkling lights, and that's what, uh, this is phenomenal. We're talking about phenomena um, that, that we cannot even begin to characterize. We're learning so much every day about muscle. Um, and again, um, when we move our bodies, we drink up glucose, we do all sorts of wonderful things to all parts of the body. And of course, very importantly, decreasing inflammation, interfering potentially with fibrosis. And again, here we go. Our relationship with exercise, it's an ever growing thing. And um, in all sorts of ways, it's a growing thing. So these are some of the things that we know about people with systemic sclerosis and their muscles. Why just focusing on their muscles? Because we're talking about muscle here in exercise and we're talking about muscles being the ones responsible for emitting these gorgeous um, substances. And so the more muscle mass we have, the more muscle strength, the more muscle mass, and meaning the volume and also the density of muscle fibers, um, more it's mass and fibers, the more we have available to, uh, in terms of these wonderful substances. So this is why I'm focusing on muscle. So we know in systemic sclerosis, there's, it's very common that there's reduced muscle strength, there's atrophy, meaning less volume, 
um, and very likely um, less intensity, less intensity of density. Um, we know that the, 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 well, there's lack of muscle endurance, meaning being able to sustain, that's probably the biggest issue in a person with, with systemic sclerosis. They may pass a muscle test where we just, oh, push against my hand, da, 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 da. Um, might pass that, but raising your arm five times, you're gonna get are more likely to describe being uh, tired after five goes. Um, so that's endurance. Um, and then impaired mobility, are moving through space, one thing, the other, is um, of the joints themselves and the ability of the joints to relax open and also the ability to contract, close as we need them. Um, and cardiopulmonary reserve, yes. So we know that muscle loss is more prominent in people with cardiopulmonary disease, meaning ILD, pulmonary fibrosis, or pulmonary hypertension. But across the board, even without, without those, it is more intense in, that, in those populations. But even in populations of systemic sclerosis without cardiopulmonary involvement, there's uh, less cardiopulmonary capacity and reserve. And that could be from deconditioning, that could be from inflammation, the way the body feels and making muscle less, less um, powerful. And um, um, so, um, and, and, or just feeling terrible. And so therefore we're not moving our bodies as much as we should, and we're losing conditioning. So reported benefits that have been reported by patients, Henrik Petherson, uh, the, uh, one of our founders of G-Force, um, he, several articles, he's dedicated his PhD to exercise and systemic sclerosis. And he talked to many people living with systemic sclerosis about how they felt about exercise. Um, benefits that they've they saw, which was improved blood circulation, particularly the hands, feet, and prolonged core warming. You know, we talk a lot about keeping your hands and your feet warm, your ears warm, but core, core warmth is a very important issue, and keeping our bodies warm in our core affects, um, we believe, the, the, how quickly our, the rest of our body gets cold. So if our core is warmer, less likely less rapidly and less perhaps frequently. So keeping our body core warm is much easier when we're physically fit um, and when we're exercising. Um, uh, improved breathing, fatigue, decreased pain, improved sleep quality, improved vitality, and improved musculoskeletal function are all things that patients with systemic sclerosis found to be beneficial. There was also discussions and reports that being, being an exerciser or engaging in regular exercise improves their social confidence regarding certain stigmatization that happens with systemic sclerosis um, and increased one's perception of body satisfaction. Yeah, so that's a beautiful thing. I feel beautiful when I exercise, I feel beautiful. So common things, um, again, these, were these are selected quotes reflecting common experiences of people living with systemic sclerosis. The more I exercise, the more um, improved my health and the more improved the chance of my survival. Um, so there was consistently hopeful expressions. Also, alternatively, inactivity was con con uh, um, consistently associated with a further decline in health status. Um, and uh, because of my lung disease, I, they'd been close to death a few times and noticed a big difference when they had stopped exercising. Um, and exercising and not exercising is like night and day. It's another quote. Um, but despite people perceiving exercise as essential for life and health, enough patients did not engage with exercise. And so this is really important for us to understand. What are the barriers? What are the things folks need to know about exercise to make them feel safe, to make them feel confident? Um, and multifactorial demotivators uh, that patients reported consistently improved those manifestations related to systemic sclerosis like digital ulcers, joint pain, or restricted mobility. These were all mentioned on, these, on, the, on the round table by, by our attendees. 
constitutional effects of disease, pain and fatigue, uh, psychosocial struggles of living with systemic sclerosis. Remember, I said about how the uncertainty of life, psychological, emotional, this is, these are heavy things, heavy things on ourselves and on the body. Um, um, and a fear and a lack of exercise safety knowledge are other, is another um, uh, issue. Um, and, and again, the logistical burden of, of preparing to exercise and exercise participation. And a lot of that has to do with people perhaps not recognizing the creative scope of what exercise actually is. So we'll get there. Um, reported important considerations by patients for that planning, um, time for planning, adaptation to the limitations of mobility, digital ulcers, pain or fatigue is important. It's important to adapt for changing symptoms, but, and that's meaning increasing symptoms or changing in, increased disease activity, being a bit kinder with yourself. Um, and, and having alternatives for if you, if you tend to be an outdoor person um, for inclement weather to, in order to be able to keep exercising regularly. Um, but there were concerns about post-exercise recovery time, how long it takes to, uh, to, to, to not feel fatigued in your muscles or fatigued in your body or um, to recover with your breathe, with breathing or heart rate, especially after vigorous exercise. And most importantly was this feeling of needing um, counseling from healthcare professionals that felt confident themselves in counseling on exercise and felt that if folks had engaged earlier in exercise that they might have reaped greater benefits. So exercise is for everybody. Everybody uh, can exercise and most every exercise can be modified for, um, for every level, every ability, um, whether, you're a, whether you're a person that likes to stand or is able to stand, prefers to sit or feels incapacitated lying. Exercise happens wherever we're at. And um, and uh, I like to say that it's special like that. Um, uh, so a quick review, uh, knowing just so you know, um, muscle is attached to bone through the tendons. The tendons are part of the fibers, part of muscles that that uh, that move out and allow allow attachment to bone. Um, so tendons attach muscle to bone, um, and Ligaments, ligaments are important. Um, they attach bone to bone. The hip bone's connected to the thigh bone um, and it's connected by a ligament. Um, but we don't wanna overstress tendons and we don't want to overstress the ligaments. Although when we exercise, they are lubricated, tendons and ligaments are lubricated by exercise. The force of exercise needs to be in the belly of the muscle. And when we do that, when we allow the movement to be in the belly of the muscle, then we're protecting the, the joint from destabilization. We're protecting um, those, um, those elements, ligaments and tendons from tearing. And we're also preventing um, the stronger we get in muscle, we're protecting mus muscle tear. So I just wanted to, briefly say here, muscles converge on most joints, most every joint. And the knee joint is a complicated joint, the, is an example. And the knee is only as strong as the muscles that converge on it. If we have strong muscles that surround and converge on the knee joint, here we see we have the quadriceps here moving in. Um, and in the back, we'd have the hamstrings um, and um, the, in the other deeper layers of muscle attaching and, and likewise up from the calf. Um, uh, when we have strong muscles here, we're less likely to cause those problems that we experience in the knees. And that's as long as we're listening to our body because then if, again, like if we overstress, if we overperform, if we're not listening to the size that we're, uh, the movement that we're happy with and the speed and the intensity of the move, then we can hurt ourselves. But what we're doing, everything that we're doing is really going towards moving to strengthen that, increase that mass of muscle, strengthen the muscle and increase the density of the fibers in that muscle so that we can protect the joints, provide shock absorbers for the joints and, and have 
strong straps on the joints the muscles that uh, of the muscles that that prevent destabilization so muscle strength and mass protects tendons ligaments alignments alignment of the joint muscle contraction promotes chemicals for joint lubrication ligament lubrication reduction of inflammation locally yeah and systemically and healthy bone and cartilage when your muscles contracting on top the bone underneath is stimulated to get stronger and um and it and it, and it helps with the cartilage as well the cartilage is what overlies your bone that gets worn out and that's that's what we call degenerative joint disease and it, that's the commonplace occurrence to many people in life um and um that's osteoarthritis same thing, degenerative joint disease, osteoarthritis is the wearing of, of that cartilage, which is protected when we have strong muscles. Um, and so, and so muscle means safety. So here we go. I want to just talk about our perceptions of muscle. Muscle is the big swathy thing here. Well, that's what we think of when we think of muscles. We think of big biceps, swaths of muscle, lengths of muscle, widths of muscle. But here, even in this, um, uh, area where there's large muscles. Look, we see these tiny muscles attaching to the bone, attaching to other things, weaving in and out and under and in between these larger muscles. And it's again, these deeper muscles, when we relax, we allow them to pick up and take, take on the intrinsic work and then only uh, engage these big, larger muscles, which we like to engage, but, we, it, but they're engaged more intelligently and we're not over using them and therefore putting stress on the joints. Um, here again, we see the same thing in the back. We think of the back as one big ah, back muscle. But actually what we, we have here is so many um, myriads of muscles. Again, tiny, large, weaving in, weaving out. And, these, and moving this body is all a chance for producing these wonderful substances that, that are healthful, that are pharmacologically um, part of our makeup. Um, and again, this big fat muscle, the diaphragm, this huge muscle, the diaphragm separates between, separates the thorax, the chest from the abdomen. Amazing, huge muscle. And the more it's move, contracting and moving, the more, again, we are emitting these beautiful substances because it's a huge muscle. Um, and not only that, we are we are regulating our breath. We're learning to regulate our breath in a happier pattern. Uh, and we're also learning perhaps better posture uh, through, through this. Um, and therefore we have more of an open thorax, which allows for more efficient breathing. Uh, and this big fat muscle, it also, when it's contracting, you know what it's doing? It's massaging. Um, our uh, abdomen with all our GI organs in it, which is very important for GI motility and neurohormonal health of the GI tract. And again, when we exercise, when we're contracting muscle, there are healthy microbiome, all those organisms and healthy bacteria are, are being populated. So we know that this organ, this, sorry, this muscle, this huge muscle called the diaphragm is, um, importantly um, recognized as when it's stronger to enhance balance, increase balance and, and reduce back pain. Um, and also uh, help with um, uh, general uh, gait move as we walk and, and, and assists our, in our walking, improves our walking. So, and it also, again, this huge muscle as it massages the abdomen, it's also massaging the lungs. And I'm going to just take a pause for one second as I try to turn on some lights here. Okay, so hopefully this is a little bit lighter as it's getting dark here in New Orleans. Um, the fun's, that's always fun here. Um, but there's a lot of music particularly tonight. Um, so, uh, so I wanted to mention the microbiome. I wanted to mention the diversity of the microbiome. And so in many conditions, we've recognized that um, uh, there is a less healthy microbiome, which is the, which is the organisms, bacteria, other, other organismic elements. Um, and this is also true in systemic sclerosis. Elizabeth Volkman has done some beautiful work, several studies demonstrating that the gut flora, um, the gut in poop in systemic sclerosis 
is not as diverse and healthy as it could be called dysbiosis. Um, so it's not it's not as a healthy environment as it can be. And we know that when we exercise from other studies that this increases the diversity of, the, of our happy microbiome, all these beautiful elements, organismal elements here. Um, um, and, and also when we eat healthy, we do that too. And they synergize eating healthier foods um, less processed. Um, if you happen to eat meat, less uh, meat that was raised in a healthy environment, so there's less stress, less antibiotic use. Those are the things that can impact our um, microbiome. Um, and um, so, exercise. When we exercise, we can enhance the the diversity of this microbiome. And so, this is very important consideration in systemic sclerosis and an important area of research. Can exercise in systemic sclerosis change the microbiome uh, in a person with systemic sclerosis? Um, uh, that's, I guess, that's Dr. Volkman's next step. And she's also part of GeForce. Of course she is. Um, so um, mindfulness, um, less stress also, um, being mindful about how much we're stressing and maybe helping ourselves feel beautiful so that we're not stressing so much. Um, that also enhances our microbiome. Um, singing um, is another great exercise. Again, we're using that large diaphragm, moving the body through space, the body in motion, everything pleasurable. And um, it, 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 it's good. They're happy. Hooray, they say. Okay, so I wanna just bring attention to the face. So we talked about those huge, large muscles swathing down the body, but I want everybody just to take your fingers and just touch your face because everywhere you touch, bang, bang, everywhere you touch, you're going to feel muscle around your lips, eyelids, top of the eyelids. This is all muscle, meaning, yes, we can make facial expressions. Yes, we can chew. Yes, we can sing but we're contracting those muscles and those muscles are also sources of those gorgeous substances. Um, so that's, this is the light that we have for that. Um, and so that is uh, important consideration. Um, and um, I want us just to, for one second to try this. I want everyone just to close your eyes and then I want you to close your eyes gently but keep them sealed. And then I want you to try to lift your eyelids open. Lift your eyelids open, but don't open your eyes. Lift them open. Can you feel those muscles? Yes, you can. And you, they feel a little sparkly now and they might be a little tired, but they also feel more alert. Your eyes might feel more alert. You also might've noticed that your eyes became maybe a little bit wetter. Um, and that's also another issue is um, salivation and, and um, lacrimation, tearing in systemic sclerosis. Now I want you to try this one. So close your eyes again, same deal. Top lids, relaxing onto the bottom lids. Now try to open the lids, pulling them open, trying to pull them open, but keeping your eyelids shut. You feel those muscles now. Look to the right when you're pulling down the eyelids. Oh, that's hard work. And then look to the left. Wow. Woo, that's a lot of work. I can feel it in my muscles. And those muscles are contracting, they're working, and my eyes feel fresher and my eyes feel wetter. Um, so I'm just saying. Um, and this is another muscle. Another big muscle is your tongue. So talking, singing, laughing, chewing, um, humming, um, chanting, intoning, we use our, we use our tongue in all those ways. Um, and so, and, and mouth health is very important in systemic sclerosis. Um, I, I, I think one of the most essential things a person living with systemic sclerosis can be doing for themselves is learning from Janet Poole going online, 
looking at and reviewing and relearning these exercises and practicing them for hands, face. Um, she also has a fatigue study out now. Um, and so if you can get in touch with me, you can get in touch with her. Um, um, but, but using these types of exercises. And of course, Janet is part of G-Force as well. Okay, and everyone's welcome to be part of G-Force. It's just that we happen to be the ones that kind of gravitated towards each other and said, we've got to do something about this. So Janet Poole, Hero, Scleroderma. Um, so feet. So in the way that I showed you the small facial muscles um, and, and the many facial muscles, we have those in our hands. Um, and and, and uh, Janet will go over those um, in her videos, uh, but we also have those in our feet. Why am I bothering to talk about our feet? Our feet are so important. Uh, when, we, when our feet are relaxed, strong, responsive, um, it's, it's tremendously important for a number of reasons. It's important, yes, for balance. Yes, for having more easeful gait and propelling ourselves through space, um, which, is, which, is mu which tends to be much more important. And it helps to offset the feeling of being breathless when you have a cardiopulmonary disease, you have good, responsive, sensitive, strong feet. But there's so much sensation at the bottom of the foot also that tracks to the brain. Um, uh, and there's just so much. And uh, one thing I do wanna say is that uh, elevating our legs also is very helpful. And, um, it, um, and it, it can alleviate tiredness if you are somebody that tends to swell in your legs um, and, or, or your arms, especially if you have a diffuse cutaneous and early, sometimes putting your arms up, lying down, putting your arms up um, and or putting your legs up for 15 or 20 minutes, you might be able to feel some relief from the tenseness of the fluid um, in the uh, edema. So it helps to move lymph too as well. So um, this diagram and all of the tables that you are just gonna see here are on the publication that's part of the hub. Um, aerobic capacity, cardiopulmonary fitness, we've talked about this. Uh, when, we, when we practice exercise, we, we, can, we help with all these things as well as we practice a more healthier thoracic shape and openness to our joints and our bodies. Um, diaphragmatic strength, we just talked a lot about diaphragmatic strength and what it does. Muscle strength and muscle endurance. Um, through exercise, of course, uh, we know it as being something that strengthens um, our muscles, but more than that, um, it provides that that strengthening more than just being Popeye-like um, and able to do things um, creates um, a whole other area, whole other areas of ease, um, ease in um, our our joint stability, our postural stability, um, and and how aligned we are in our joints and our posture, the range of motion, more likely to have more range of motion because remember joint lubrication. Um, happens from the muscle and ligament and rotation um, um, and bone health. Um, circulation, we've talked about this. Um, we can't talk enough about this. There's so much work and research that needs to be done in this area of exercise as a, a modifier of blood flow circulation and vascular repair, repairing blood vessels that might have been injured by systemic sclerosis. Um, circulation is also important for sexual health. Um, um, we know in enhancing circulation and, and practice exercises impacts erectile dysfunction, for example. And so, um, and so it's hypothesized it would count, it would, it would uh, impact favorably the counter um, female um, function. Um, um, and skin function, circulation is very important for maintaining healthy skin and, and, and wound healing. Um, inflammation reduction, we've talked about this, fibrosis helps to, to break up the fibrotic uh, networks um, called ECM, uh, extracellular matrix, it downregulates fibrotic pathways, and in, in terms of other immune function, beyond what we know in systemic sclerosis and what we experience in systemic sclerosis, immune function is, um, is enhanced, and that means anti-infective uh, um, behavior uh, occurs in the body um, after exercise. Um, and, and that's important for the mouth. 
that's important for if we have wounds um, and also anti-carcinogenic. Now there's tomes and tomes of literature now, maybe I shouldn't say tomes and tomes, but there's a lot of literature now that directly um, associates exercise with decreased recurrence of cancer, decreased incidence of certain cancer. And some of those cancers are GI cancers of which um, uh, folks with systemic sclerosis might be more susceptible. Um, so this is, these are, these are um, now um, accepted, accepted um, paradigms of exercise in terms of cancer and, and infection. GI function, we talked about this, but we'll talk just a little bit more. Um, moving our bodies, it assists with gastric emptying. Um, it, it helps to maybe offset nausea. When we move our bodies, we create natural anti-emetics. As, as long as our body's not full and we're not overexerting ourselves, can help relieve cramping and gas pocketing. Um, and it, again, microbiome health and reduces the risk of GI malignancy. The skin function, when we exercise, we, um, it's not solely because of circulation, but circulation helps, but we're actually moving that skin and we're moving the muscle underneath that skin. And that helps with, and, um, in addition to sweating, it helps with um, uh, moving lymph, moving again, especially in, with um, our, our colleagues, uh, Janet Poole, um, our colleagues in Hungary, Cecilia Varju, um, uh, Laszlo Atsernik, um, uh, have demonstrated the um, that there is a potentially favorable effect on of skin thickening, and if we nourish the skin when we exercise and we move our bodies. We give it what it wants, and we give it an opportunity to function in a healthier way. Um, oral health, all of the same things that we talked about. Um, increasing salivation it has been associated with exercise, and when we have more salivation, we, we protect ourselves from dental caries. Um, and um, um, infection, um, and uh, we, if we do our targeted exercising uh, with Janet Poole, we, we, we may be affecting the tightness of the skin on the face and the ability for the mouth to um, be more open. The hand function, enough said, right? When, we, when we're exercising our hands, we're increasing circulation, impacting the warmth of the hands, impacting the potential healing ability um, uh, of what we're doing on any um, uh, potential wounds, um, skin tightness, range of motion, you name it, foot and ankle, same deal, gait and balance we talked about. And then health-related quality of life, we've talked about the psychological effects, um, stress reduction that it brings, bring, it brings exercise brings sleep quality, can decrease fatigue, uh, body pain, self-esteem. We saw all of these and sexual function. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but again, I just wanted to bring everybody back to their inner guru um, and remind how important this um, concept is of befriending yourself, befriending yourself in motion and befriending you, who you are in this beautiful body. Um, I, this was, I was gonna demonstrate uh, the shoulder complex joint, but what, what we will do is um, maybe if everybody can just raise your arms, well, if you can raise them overhead, that's fine. If you're having trouble, you can just raise your elbows even and notice how your chest shapes, sh changes. Notice how your arms open up and your shoulders can open up because the arms, remember, they're connected, they're connected to the back. And when we're more open, when, when we exercise, we can learn a more openness. When we listen to that guru again and be softer, our joints can be more open and work more optimally. So if I'm crunching, doing something really like lifting and just trying to bust it out of the park, but not enjoying myself, I'm clenching in my shoulders and I'm cricking and cracking. If I listen to my body doing the same thing, listen to the skin, uh, air on my skin, listen to the beautiful seated massage in the muscles deep in wherever they happen to be, the back or the shoulders, I'm less likely to crunch those joints. Those joints are gonna move with more space. And by the way, just uh, this arms up business, it's a big deal in most cultures, Native American culture, East Indian cultures, um, uh, Buddhist cultures. This is, this is like the quintessential exercise to, to 
create space within here. It helps to release the neck, the arms, this whole cage opens, your breathing uh, apparatus opens so that you can breathe more efficiently. It's a practice. And, and then once you've finished your arms up, or as it's called, um, or Bahastasan in Sanskrit, um, uh, you carry that with you. Every movement we do, we carry it with us. The healthful, beautiful things we do, we educate ourselves. It creates a different sensation in our body. Um, I don't want to frustrate people, so I'm going to move my, my picture so you can see what I wrote. Um, and so you're just loving, loving on yourself in an open, unfurling way. Beautiful. Okay, so uh, aerobic exercise. I, we talked a little bit about this. So I'm not going to spend so much time. Um, you know, uh, you know where you're at. You know what moderate exercise is. You can listen to yourself again. 30 minutes a day, five days a week is our goal. And when we when we're calling this exercise, um, we we're, we're it means that there's a 10 minutes of consecutive time. So that 30 minutes can be broken up to two 15 minute slots, or as long as it's at least 10 minutes. And this is in accordance with the World Health Organization's um, 2020 edict. So um, yes, um, um, but it's a goal. Remember, it's a goal. It's what we work towards. So you might be able to do 10 minutes of something light, but whatever it is, it just takes you to, to that moderate experience of exercise. Um, resistance, again, muscle strength versus muscle endurance. Um, remember, one is the pow and the other is the keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. And so when we're, when we're training for muscle strength, we want to give ourselves more intensity, but do it less. When we're trying to go for endurance, which is what more, is generally more needed in systemic sclerosis, we're, we're doing less intensity, less weight or less impact, um, but more repetitions. Um, but there's so many ways. I mean, this is if we're just looking at weight training or but there's so many ways of doing this yoga for example dancing there's so much so many other activities combined strength stretch endurance and aerobics um i'm gonna move me again um stretching so i do want to talk about stretching because it's really important in systemic sclerosis uh important for everybody in the world but important for it's, it's how occurs naturally it's a natural phenomenon all cute little creatures you saw Violet, I don't know if you saw her a minute ago stretching, but um, um, yes, so it regulates the muscle fiber length. And what stretching is, it, it is stretching just beyond the optimal length so that you're sensitizing the muscles. So you're giving it a stretch, especially if it's, especially in a direction other than you're used to living your life in, right? So, um, so for example, if I'm here like this typing, I want to you know, I want to give myself nice time to move my muscles and lengthen them in the other direction. Um, same with the hands. Mm -hmm. um, so we're regulating these muscle fibers, we're giving them a chance to, to stretch and elongate optimally so they don't shrink up. Um, and, and what we do when we're doing that is we're also sensitizing them to be sensitive, we're also sensitizing them to be recognizing when force is too much force that it could hurt us. So they're, they become much they become much more sensitive. They become better readers of movement and better readers of what's healthful for us when we stretch um, because there's this uh, interaction or conversation uh, automatically that happens. Um, we improve our range of motion. We improve our flexibility. Um, when we stretching enhances balance and, and how, how well we know we are within space and in terms of where we are within space. Um, so, so we become, it's called proprioception. So we're conditioning muscles and nerves by stretching. So we know where we are in space. That means that if we're up toppling over, for example, we're, we're more likely to catch ourselves because we have a better idea of where we are in space. Not to mention that, that our feet are stronger because we've been exercising and, and so on. When we stretch, we are increasing, um, the blood flow and warmth 
to the muscles and to the rest of our body. And that means we, we're also enhancing the uh, same with exercise. We're enhancing the blood vessel numbers. We're allowing the muscles to, to remove waste and alleviate stiffness. Beautiful. So one thing that um, uh, warming up uh, prior to stretching is nice by just some loose, beautiful movements. Um, um, or um, you might find if you go to the occupational therapist before you do hand exercises, maybe that they're warming your hands externally with maybe sandbags or maybe some paraffin wax. This helps the joints to be more supple and you can, they're warmer, the blood vessels are more open. That means there's more blood rushing through them. And when there's more blood rushing through them and more warm blood rushing through them, that means the blood cells are giving off more oxygen to tissue. They're, they're not holding on to, the, the blood cells are not holding on to oxygen. They're saying, here, take it. Here, tissue, have oxygen. So anyway, so warming the body, increasing the blood flow, dilating the blood vessels, all of that helps to improve oxygenation or the generosity of oxygenation from the blood to the, to the rest of the body, including the blood vessels and blood vessel walls and the other tissue. So how do we stretch? Stretching again, um, we're going for that sensation that's safe. What is it? It's that resistance sensation. It's, it's, it's a, we had arguments with this in the, the G-force of how are we going to talk about this? It's a good pain. I'm like, you can't say it's a good pain, but, but okay. So we made a compromise. It's a good pain, but it's not a pain that's bad. It's a, but, but it's, you know, it's not bad. Um, so it's a good pain, meaning it's like a good, it's a good sensation. It's a result. So I say it's a resistant sensation where you're just feeling that mm, kind of delicious feeling maybe that maybe you've gone you've gone to a good place uh, because you don't want to overstretch you certainly don't want to bounce no bouncing no bouncing unless you're here in new orleans doing some some bounce with us but no stretching it does not entail bouncing stretching entails el luxuriating in a direction and you and, and and staying in that direction long enough 30 to 60 seconds so that those muscles can relax in the length that you're provide that you're suggesting and so um and so and therefore that allows um um the breath to synchronize also with this stretch so it should be luxurious it's sensual it's did i say luxurious yes it's delicious it's gorgeous gorgeous feeling so for the so the american um college of sports medicine suggests generally folks should be 10 minutes a day two to three days per week we think that that's not the case for systemic sclerosis we think systemic patients with systemic sclerosis require more vigilance, more targeted exercise, um, and and different types of exercise, different types of stretch, um, and that could be throughout the day, um, sparked by how they feel, or or in a regimented way throughout the day, um, upon waking or or prior to sleep. So safety and comfort. Who can exercise? Well, anybody with systemic sclerosis that's known to not have pulmonary or cardiac involvement, they can do whatever they want. Exercise, do whatever you want in terms of aerobic exercise, um, no problem. Now, when we're moving on to um, um, cardiopulmonary involvement, for all levels of disease severity, we recognize that exercise is, manageable, it's feasible, it's safe, and it's effective. Um, but, there's a but, patients need to be screened. And every systemic sclerosis patient should be followed with these tests. So you shouldn't be worried, am I that person? Because if you are being cared for in a way that, we, that a systemic sclerosis patient should be cared for, you will be getting these tests, annual echocardiograms, serial pulmonary function tests, six minute walk tests where we check your oxygen as you're moving. Um, so um, all of those things and monitoring your symptoms. 
um, and how your symptoms change. And if you're having symptoms, for example, of, of heart palpitations, or you're feeling very faint when you exercise, those are symptoms that you need to contact the, your physician for. We do like for patients to go to pulmonary rehab, learn how to monitor their own exercise and um, a cardiopulmonary health if folks do have pulmonary fibrosis or cardiac involvement or pulmonary hypertension. Um, but generally speaking, folks with mild disease, as long as they're listening to themselves, they're usually fine on their own. Um, um, yeah, and, um, but, um, but folks with moderate to severe, to severe disease, we really, really encourage um, learning with an expert, a specialist, a respiratory specialist, or a physiotherapist specialist, um, uh, your exercise parameters, what's safe for you. Um, in terms of somebody that has myopathy, meaning muscle involvement, and cardiopulmonary involvement, sometimes we may have to go slow on the cardiopulmonary issues and just work on um, getting the muscle mass up to snuff um, so that um, folks have a better capacity when they do engage in aerobics. So very importantly, this breathlessness. So um, this concept of breathlessness, breathlessness is a sensation. It's a sensation that we're often, and it's very different if somebody who doesn't have a condition, a health condition gets breathless, they know they're gonna get their breath back. They don't have the same problems and relationship with breathlessness as people that have a health condition that has uh, that that has lung and heart issues and that you do experience breathlessness in those situations breathlessness has a lot of other neuro um, psychological physiological cognitive overlay that make breathlessness a confusing thing to interpret and to live with um, and it and 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 it creates emotional distress. Whereas in somebody that doesn't have a cardiopulmonary issue, it, we don't find it. It creates emotional distress. In aside from some major past history traumas, let's just put it that way. Um, but um, but it's different from just garden variety exertional breathlessness. Um, people that have cardiopulmonary diseases, they worry over what breathlessness is meaning at that time that they feel breathless. They are, um, there's thoughts going through their head um, with worry. Um, and this can interfere with one's ability to engage in exercise or desire to engage in exercise or feel safe when you exercise. But one thing that we know is that breathlessness is not the same as low oxygen. Um, breathlessness, is a sensation. Low oxygen is a chemical uh, distinction. And yes, you can get breathless when your oxygen is low, um, but you can also get breathless from many other things. You can get breathless from being anxious. You can get breathless even from being depressed. You can get breathless from, um, from being uh, deconditioned, from not having good enough muscle mass. Um, there's many reasons that you could be that you could be breathless, um, it, including other um, important um, health conditions. And so uh, we we try to we pro we try to provide a guide to this for healthcare professionals as well in our in our study. Um, so, um, but in and of itself, breathlessness in and of itself, outside of low oxygen saturation and outside of other major uh, causes is not is not physiologically harmful and um, but what does happen is when but we do know that being physically unfit being physically unfit causes breathlessness causes fatigue and we know that exercise treats physical fitness and and therefore ultimately treats coping with breathlessness um, but physical exercise also causes breathlessness. So therefore we have to become breathless, right? That moderate intensity. Um, we have to become breathless in order to become physically fit 
and in order to become less breathless over time. And, and what is reassuring is, is that there are many, many, many ways of exercising that's not distressing and pleasurable um, that you can engage in, that you might feel a little breathless, but over time you will conquer it in that particular level of intensity. Um, yes. So uh, another issue that's important to recognize is this, that we all have, many of us have dysfunctional breathing patterns or breath patterns that are just not helpful for breathing. You don't have to have a cardiopulmonary problem. Many of us do have, uh, we hold our breath or we hyperventilate or breathe very quickly. Um, and that's, um, and mindfulness helps with that. That's again, another self-regulation thing, feeling the physical breath in the body. That, um, and that's one thing that helps us to overcome this. But it seems that more people that have cardiopulmonary problems have a higher risk of developing this discoordinated breathing, which makes, it, makes themselves seem more breathless, which makes their cardiopulmonary condition seem worse because it is worth it's because we're not breathing efficiently. So if we learn how to breathe more efficiently, we can intake oxygen and use it more efficiently um, by um, uh, aligning ourselves with better breathing uh, patterns and habits. And we'll be producing some, some instructional videos on this as well. Um, so um, yes, is there anything else here? Yes. So, Many things can help regulate breathing. Exercise helps us to regulate our breathing because we are breathing usually in a rhythm. And that helps us. And when we're, when we're connecting with our inner guru, we're much more likely to fall into that healthy breathing rhythm. We're feeling the world around us, feeling our body moving through space. Um, singing and engaging that diaphragm purposefully is another way that helps us. Um, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Bala Subramanian, uh, I, I'm not sure if he did it. Uh, he always does a beautiful uh, talk about different breathing exercises that are very good for scleroderma, where we're actually engaging breathing, like the humming breath, the bumblebee breath. Um, mm, mm, mm. So we're creating that sensation in our body that's aligned with the movement of the breath, even if we're not paying attention to the breath. These are all self-regulatory mechanisms that yes, they help us self-regulate, but they also strengthen all these different parts of our body and engage all the different uh, muscles in our body. Okay, safety, uh, just um, stop and read that. Stop the video and read that. Um, warming up, you can do the same, stop the video and read that. Um, just basically not overstretching, a little bit of warm up, bringing blood um, to the body. Um, accommodations again, whoop, whoop, move this. Um, all peeps can exercise, all peoples. All peoples can exercise. Exercise happens wherever we're at, whatever level, whatever ability, um, where, where, at whatever point we get breathless, exercise happens wherever we're at. It's special like that. So standing, sitting, lying, accommodating for hand grips, um, if you join me in one of our yoga rehab sessions, our dance rehab sessions, along the way I provide accommodations for um, contractures or other uh, problems that people might have been being experiencing with moving or accomplishing certain exercises like downward facing dog when 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 our fingers don't don't relax all the way. Um, uh, very importantly, people feel pain in their feet. This was one of the things that was brought up today in the in in the in the chat. Um, a very important, painful feet. You may need to sit, you may need to lie down um, to do these exercises and to get, um, get yourself in that moderate intensity. No problem. Um, and using targeted feet exercises, but also there's other options uh, and accommodations like um, inner soles for your shoes, getting good shoes that have good support and the inner soles that, that might offset the discomfort that you're feeling. Something else that um, folks don't discuss often is lamb's wool. You can get this at the pharmacy. It's like a cotton wool, but it doesn't smash and compress the way cotton wool does. It doesn't, so it, it stays, um, it stays aerated, it stays cushioning. 
So you can put it under where it hurts or around where it hurts or between toes, um, underneath the foot, in the shoe, um, between. Um, but so that's another thing to think about um, in terms of enhancing your experience of exercise. Ladies, the cats are getting really, um, uh, they're having a wrestling match exercise. Um, so um, having an alternative plan for cold weather, again, keeping your body warm is so important. Gloves, if you have ulcers, um, you can wear exercise gloves, you can wear other types of gloves. Um, uh, and if you have arthritis in your hands, sore hands, um, sometimes having a Tylenol or something before you start exercising, a little bit of analgesic might help exercise. These are things to discuss with your clinicians, your physiotherapists, your physician, your, your occupational therapist. Um, okay, you guys got the picture by now. Start gently, adding a little bit of time, adding inten intensity, increasing intensity. I know you understand these goals. Um, physical activity, wherever you can, wherever you can. Arms up. Um, that butt muscle is a huge muscle. If you're sitting there, squeeze it. It's big, see, this is, I'm squeezing it and it gives me, I don't know, it gives me like five inches, but, but there's so much you could do. Wiggle your toes, flex your feet back and forth, get up and bring just a couple of pieces of paper to the paper shredder instead of waiting for a stack. Keep that body moving, moving, keep it moving, moving. Anything to keep the body moving as much as possible. So other times that we can incorporate healthful movement, especially in systemic sclerosis is before we go to sleep, having gentle stretching, gentle fluid movement can help repair the muscles um, and give them the experience of the counter stretch in the other direction to relax and to surrender to a healthy night's sleep. And if we have a habit of this, um, um, when we start to stretch, the brain will be signaled to allow the body to move into sleep more readily, more quickly. Um, so, and we know good sleep is so important for so many things. Sleep quality, good sleep quality reduces inflammation. Um, so other helpful times is when we're, when we're, when we're waking up, sorry, smack myself in the middle of the screen, but when we're waking up, um, there's so much that goes through the body and the mind when we wake up, it's a transition time. Um, the body's feeling maybe heavy, maybe, maybe the joints are feeling stiff. We have to give them a chance to warm up. Remember when we start to, when we start to move gently, we invoke warmth, the blood vessels open, blood flows, blood flows more uh, quickly through the, through the blood vessels. And, um, and as all of that happens, the, the, um, blood, the blood cells become more generous and gives away lots of oxygen to the blood vessel walls and to all the different parts of the body. So starting the day by moving in the bed or having gentle movement out, um, out, out of the bed in the beginning helps the body transition into moving into the day. Um, and there's loads of ways of doing that. And um, I think I even have a video of this on, 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 my, on my YouTube channel. Um, but the other thing that's really important is many of us wake up with anxiety. We open our eyes and think of all the things that we haven't done. We think about the worry related to a test result or the dread of going to get a test um, or, or, or many other things in our life. But in having this opportunity to move as we wake up, have this time for ourselves to connect with our guru helps us put things in a better place, in perspective, helps us to connect with our beauty as we move through the day so that those monsters in our head can be cute little monsters, not overbearing, overtaking monsters. So because they have their place, we need our, we need our, we need our difficult thoughts for many reasons. So we can't push them away. We have to live with them. And we live with them by keeping perspective and remembering that we're beautiful. Um, humming and singing in bed, hooray. Okay, Leslie migrating, Leslie migrating. Okay, Leslie migrating to here. Um, so also movement anytime, healthful times, you know when you need to move. These times are hard times. We're so much stress, so much loss. We're in front of the, the, 
the computer so much. We're in our house so much, not moving as much as we did in these, um, in the in this uh, sorrowful COVID times where we have positive things we're learning about ourselves, but it's also very, very hard life. Um, um, and so moving can help this um, and relieve this stress, relieve this distress. And don't forget that when we move, I mean, when we're in front of the computer and when we're feeling bad, our body closes in. This is all science. Body closes in, what happens? Our muscles don't move as much, they get stiff. And also we're closing off our air passage. We're closing off the chest. We're closing off our airway. Um, and we're feeling more introverted. This is all science. Nina Bull in the 50s, she started it all. Um, um, beautiful work. But when we, when we open ourselves up, you can't help but feel joy. You can't help but feel the breath in your body. When your armpits, the swaths of your armpits are soft and open, um, it's, a, it's a different feeling. So there you go. Okay, again, arms up, Ardva Hastasin. Virtually every religion uh, worldwide has this as one of the most important exercise, uh, postures, exercises. Okay, so very importantly, what about when I'm flaring? What about when I feel so bad? What about when I'm in such pain? What about after surgery? You know, you know, you already know right now what to do. There's so many things that you can be doing in a gentle, loving way that nurtures yourself through these times. And that also helps with the healing and helps with reducing inflammation and pain. You'll find your way. You're listening to your inner guru. You need some loving care, humming, singing, um, feet extension, ankle flexion. If you, wanna, if you want to tense, you know, contract your bottom, contract your legs, um, doing those morning exercises that you do that are gentle, gentle balancing exercises, can't say enough about balancing exercises. Um, so aquatic therapy, I'm gonna say just very quickly about this, this can be read about, we love it. Why do we love it? I mean, as human beings, why do we love the water? It feels so good, it feels so good. But it, it feels so good, it's deceptively hard. It's deceptively a harder environment to exercise in, even though we exercise more easily in that environment because it's buoyant, it, but we have more resistance. So we, so when we're, so I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second, but, but hands down in many different um, uh, health conditions, we've noticed multiple sclerosis, different connective tissue diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus. Um, and, and there was one study that um, um, Dr. Madali Bongi did in systemic sclerosis looking looking at one of the modalities was aquatic exercise hands down it does really great things other thing that we just we talked about this whole time um, um and it's very safe it's very safe because it minimizes the risk of injury and re-injuring something it it provides buoyance buoyancy um and which is wonderful if you're somebody that has a gait problem or if you have feet pain um it, the immersion of it has this beautiful anti-gravity offloading effects. And, and that, that is all protective measures. Um, um, allows, and allows for other adaptations and accommodations for, for pain and um, uh, various impairments. And we tolerate it so well. We tolerate it so well for a number of reasons, because of its buoyancy, because it feels good. We're, and so, um, and because of its temperature effects, it bidirectionally, um, it transfers heat and it takes away heat quickly. And so that makes us feel good and yummy when we're warm, but when our body's producing heat that makes us feel tired and fatigued by exercise, it's wicking it away, it's taking it away. So we can exercise longer for longer periods of time. We can do more types of exercise, get a little bit more out of exercise in terms of time, intensity, endurance, and stretch. But we also have to be very careful that we don't over exhaust ourselves and that we don't overdo it. And one beautiful thing about exercise is where people are feeling fearful, um, they're able to experiment in that safe environment. But again, aquatic exercise, we want to be careful. Um, there's things that you want to take care take care about as a patient with systemic sclerosis, rinsing yourself off afterwards, moisturizing after skin afterwards, um, 
you know, the, the, the same deal. You know that sometimes if, if you're feeling very poorly, you might be, uh, you, you, this requires a change of clothes. You, you should not be going home in wet clothes. Um, and um, it, so you want to minimize the time that you're in uh, wet clothes and air, and you might get exhausted with the, with the clothes change. So think about those things ahead of time. You may need to make sure there's support over there to help if you're going for uh, physical therapy, so you're not in wet clothes and someone's helping you with changing. Or you might want to bring somebody a help, a companion to enjoy the time with you. Um, Again, water being a rapid conductor of heat, you want that includes when it's too cold, because you're gonna you're gonna feel worse, and you 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 need a modicum of of, of heat, uh, and especially in systemic sclerosis, to feel good um, doing exercise and to be safe while doing exercises because cold is injury in systemic sclerosis, um, and so you need to protect yourself also against overexertion. It feels so good, it feels so yummy. You want to keep going. You want to stretch even more. Um, you want to push, push, push because it doesn't feel like pushing. It's deceptive. So pace yourself and, and, and gradual increase in duration of intensity. So there's so much joy and so much pleasure um, related to, to, to exercise and so much comfort to be had in exercise. Um, there's singing. Walking is one of the best exercises. We talked about swimming and moving our little body in the water, whether it's just raising our arms up and down or jogging or raising our legs. Um, and um, Tai Chi Chuan, beautiful exercise, balance, muscle tone, gorgeous, and singing. So indoor versus outdoor. I think I might've mentioned um, that um, indoor is beautiful. Outdoor does a few things for us. There's more and more literature amassing that's demonstrating these phytochemicals. This is not just going out and, oh, I like being in nature. It feels so good. Yes, it does feel good. It feels good because we're, there's an exchange that's happening of phytochemicals on all sorts of levels. And the Japanese are really at the forefront of these, this research, looking at cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular parameters and looking at inflammation. Um, uh, of people that are spending time in the forest for an hour or so. Um, and in just a small amount of time can make a big difference. So there's one reason that we might like to be outside. Another reason is, is that being in the outside world, um, because of its sensual nature of hearing the leaves rustle, feeling the breeze on your skin, hearing the birds chirping, um, these are cues that remind us to be sensual, reminds, of, reminds us and reconnects us to our sensual engagement in exercise. Now remember that sensual, sensual engagement, it keeps us, first of all, having pleasure in the exercise and also is the safest way to practice exercise. Um, Woohoo! Oh, I did forget to mention the nice sense of being outside. Ooh. Okay, singing, you can get online. Uh, there's lots of groups. We're gonna be having a singing for lung health group or just singing for health group. Um, um, <laughs> and, uh, I, I actually, uh, I, I went and I did, I did the training for this um, with so many beautiful, beautiful people. I've learned um, so much, so much about breathing just from doing this uh, singing leaders uh, course, singing for breathing, singing for health courses. Not a few of them, are. but in any case, there's, they're online, they're available. We'll start doing some, you're always welcome. There's not one singing for breathing class in the world that I know of in the UK there's hundreds of them that happen I think of a week practically or tens at least different time zones um, you will never be turned away they're only inviting people from all over the world to join in and um, and uh, and and get their lungs strong and and uh, healthful um, and when again I'll just say that when our anything that's good for the lungs is going to be good for the GI tract so there's so much YouTube fun out there. These, this is, there's so much bliss. You can join me, but there's more bliss than just me out there. There's so much fun. The, the Kukuana uh, ladies, um, they, they have a fitness online. A lot of their stuff is free. They can do, they do it in 15 minutes. It's so gorgeous movement, music. Um, you can slow it down. 
uh, with the, your your YouTube, you know, you can make it go slower if you want. Um, you can make your movements smaller um, if you can't keep up. But you can choose one of their exercises to do as your exercise. You could choose one of their videos to do as your exercise. Um, uh, these walking classes online that kind of shake it while you move. There's a bunch of those online with Leslie Sandstone. Um, Body Groove, oh my God, that's so much fun. Body Groove is online and, and there's gonna be people there that are super fit, athletic. There's gonna be people in wheelchairs. There's people um, in, in all stages of fitness partaking in this gorgeous Body Groove experience. Do yogawithme.com, lots and lots of free videos from this Canadian website. Um, and um, you can choose what type of yoga, you can choose the level, you can choose the duration of the class you want. Um, so massage, <sighs> massage. Well, there's more in, we need to know about massage. Um, it may provide some similar effects as exercise. We know it helps with lymphatic drainage and we're, we're pretty sure it probably helps with um, edema under the skin and diffuse disease. Um, remember I told you a little bit about that before. It might have uh, skin softening properties like exercise does, but this is kind of more intense, um, a tense way of, um, uh, maybe addressing it um, and um, massages stimulates and activates the muscles to what degree though this is another area where we need to find out uh, our basic scientists getting out their um, equipment to do some measuring of biochemicals and to see what kind of difference it makes um, self-massage self-massage is a massage and it's also an exercise woohoo um, we like we like a good New Orleans bargain so when we when we're massaging ourselves with, we're, we're also using our body and also engaging muscle as well as, as, in, as this uh, effluent experience across the body and across the muscle. So again, you don't need to go through this again. So here we are, stay tuned because we from G-Force are so excited. We're so excited about the future of muscle and its relationship to systemic sclerosis and all the great research out there that can be happening. And we are, uh, we are a group that's inclusive and we, our arms are open for um, other collaborators and patients that are interested um, in, in research in systemic sclerosis and in producing educational materials or being part of research. Um, and thank you very much for being here and um, and welcome aboard this beautiful, fabulous journey um, of, of movement and feeling and being beautiful. Thank you and namaste folks. Peace.